Elon, Department, Elon University Department of Philosophy is delighted to host this roundtable discussion on Lynn Huffer's latest book, Foucault's Strange Eros. My name is Lauren Gilmet. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Elon University, where I'm currently teaching our senior seminar on Foucault and his 21st century afterlives in feminist philosophy, queer theory, decolonial theory, and disability studies. Open to the public, this webinar is the culmination of a multi-day workshop in which Elon Philosophy senior seminar students have presented their research and received feedback from top scholars. Each seminar student has a visiting scholar. In addition to joining in conversation with our invited scholars <clears throat> on their own latest work, this workshop is made possible by a generous grant from the Phi Beta Kappa Fund for Excellence, thanks to our co-sponsors, Elon's Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, the Gender and LGBTQIA Center, and the Program in Peace and Conflict Studies. Lynn Huffer is Samuel Candler Dobbs, Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Emory University, and has previously taught at Yale and at Rice Universities. Her research engages feminist theory and queer theory, French and Francophone literature, environmental humanities, and ethics. In addition to her creative nonfiction and image text publications, of which I am an enthusiast, um, she has also published five books, including her recently completed trilogy on the French philosopher Michel Foucault and what she calls Foucault's archival ethics of Eros. In Mad for Foucault, Rethinking the Foundations of Queer Theory, uh, which was published in 2009. Huffer challenges the centrality of History of Sexuality Volume 1 for the uptake of Foucauldian ideas in queer theory and shifted our attention to his earlier analysis of unreason in History of Madness. Huffer identifies a political ethics of Eros in Foucault's archival attention, at once a heavy-hearted generosity toward those whose only record bears the mark of their judgment by power, and a playful and lighthearted willingness to question one's own position vis-a-vis -vis various norms of judgment. Huffer's second installment, Are the Lips a Grave, a Queer Feminist Ethics of Sex from 2013, develops this ethics of Eros with Lusa Rigori to approach the tensions between, broadly speaking, a feminist demand for ethical norms and a queer wariness of norms. This third volume turns to Foucault's thinking about the outside, that which was historically reduced to madness, to sexuality, but which overflows and destabilizes these categories. Um, I will shortly after I finish speaking, add a link to purchase this book um, in the chat for those who are in attendance. Um, and I, uh, let's see, I look forward to hearing the thoughts of our four panelists today on this latest volume. I'm Gail Hamner of Syracuse University, Taryn Jordan of Colgate University, Perry Zern of American University, and Celine Ishlakal of Fordham University. Uh, the way things will go, panelists will speak for approximately 10 to 15 minutes each, followed by a response from Lynn Huffer, and will then open to the Q&A with the audience. I am delighted today to be accompanied in moderating this event by one of my undergraduate students, Emily Lang, who is an Elon Lumen Scholar, an Honors Fellow, and a double major in philosophy and English. Emily has focused on Lynn Huffer's work this semester, and it has been a treat for me this week to mentor and learn from Emily as her project develops and to hear Lynn Huffer's fantastic commentary on Emily's project last Wednesday. So thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, and first, we will have Gail Hamner. Emily, can you please uh, introduce Gail for us? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for being here today. So Gail Hamner is professor of religion at Syracuse University. Her monographs include American Pragmatism, a Religious Genealogy published in 2002, and Religion and Film, the Politics of Nostalgia published in 2012. Her new work rethinks the place of religion and affect in films such as Children of Men, No Country for Old Men, Tree of Life, and Black Girl, in addition to plotting toward a book that reconceptualizes religion in the public sphere for our hyperlinked and blog sphere world, a book project she, short, she shortened with the phrase public affect. She frequently teaches courses on Marx and Foucault, as well as recent feminist theory and queer theory. Today, she will kick off our roundtable with attention to the introduction of Huffer's book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, Dr. Gilmet, for, for including my participation. And thank you, Lynn, Dr. Huffer, for such a wonderful book to think with. Can you all hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Okay. 
In its widest frame, the question I raise in response to Huffer's erotic ethical practice of freedom in the introduction to her book is why are we invested in freedom? Especially at a moment of the planet that requires us to underscore our deep biological and relational connections and obligations to our non-human matrix, and a moment of US history that evidences the brutal violence of certain forms of freedom, free trade, religious freedom, freedom of expression. I wonder why we continue to sacralize this notion of freedom. I wonder if we really can avoid the connotations of individuality, rationality, and autonomy that weigh down freedom like its own shameful fetters. Also, who is this we that is so invested? In listening to black critical theorists like Sadia Hartman, whose work demonstrates how the opposite of slavery is not freedom, and Fred Moten, who si sidesteps the language of freedom and writes out of what he calls a refusal of the refusal, that is a refusal of the white refusal to grant black bodies equal rights either before the law or on our neighborhood streets. I find myself wondering if a Foucauldian erotic ethical practice of freedom might still be part of the legacy of European whiteness. Clearly, we are in urgent and exhausted times, times when even the most ardent political activist wonders about what politics is, what protest does, what kind of social transformation is possible. I brought this urgency and exhaustion to my reading of Huffer's wonderful text. Is it freedom that we're seeking in our ethics and politics? Is it Eros that fuels our protest that hovers as its goal? Please know that I pose these questions out of a deep love and engagement with Foucault, whom I read daily, like scripture, and out of a deep admiration for Huffer's books. I do realize that Foucault is not an Enlightenment thinker and also that he is not tritely opposed to the Enlightenment. His work is supremely nuanced and careful, as is Huffer's analyses of it. My questions about freedom might even seem odder when we realize that the term doesn't even appear in her index, but Huffer's introduction does deploy Eros as an ethical practice of freedom. And it, it, it does so through an undisciplined engagement in part with Herbert Marcuse's politics of Eros. Eros, politics, freedom, practice. These are the figures in the eroding cliff face with which Huffer opens her book. My comments will first engage these opening sections, then briefly her use of Marcuse with Foucault, when I will bring in Marx is what I think of as the vanishing mediator between them, before returning to the question of freedom as not telling others what to do in light of Huffer's evocation of our contemporary struggles against racism, misogyny, and devastating climate change. Huffer's opening section offers us the flash of Eros as Foucault's ethopoetic method, what she calls an e ethics of Eros as a poet. poet by hegemonic discourse. Huffer's connection of freedom with the unappropriable, the non-usable is compelling and also raises the question of how it can then make a political difference or have political effects. In her next section, Why Eros, Huffer images Eros as the background from which particular marked identities such as lesbian or queer are extracted from life and pressed into the lives of oppression and labor, like ore is extracted from the earth and processed for commodity sale. What kind of ethical release is possible in this world of extraction? If ourselves are made, appropriated by, and bound up with the forces that mark us as particular identities, with all the social capital or lack thereof entailed in such identities, then what is freedom? Huffer answers with the image of unknotting and loosening, with what she calls self-unbinding. Whatever freedom is, it cannot be claimed by who we think we are right now, because this we has been fictioned or made by unfreedom, by what Marcuse calls alienation, Nietzsche refers to as the herd and Foucault canopies under his critique of the society of norms. Self unbinding is a quiet erosion of the self, a practice that is not just negative, but also Huffer writes, quote, the cultivation of an attitude, a different abode, 
an empty and peopled space I inhabit with others, thinking as an ethical practice of freedom." Unquote. Foucault, Huffer notes, characterizes this practice as a suspension, and Huffer positions her task as suspended across ethical edges to be worked. Described this way, I understand that this eros, ethical practice of freedom, does imply other selves, and so it must imply a kind of politics, but not in the sense that tells others what to do. Rather, the ethics of eros attends to the unmaking of what has been made. It seeks what Foucault terms the concrete freedom of possible transformation. Those are Foucault's words. Freedom here is not just a mode of unappropriable speech, but a kind of thinking that is an ethical practice and a kind of space that arcs toward possible transformations. I'm not sure why this kind of speech practice and space define freedom, but I understand quite clearly how they are made from the prowling of Eros and why they form a Foucauldian ethic. Is this freedom as unconstrained? Freedom as the capacity for alternative? Freedom as access to resources for robust life? Is this an unappropriable speech or erosive thinking that opposes the unfreedom of all subjectivity? or only the unfreedom of not knowing one's own unfreedom? Is this a call to freedom that still is entwined in the enlightenment charge to dare to know, torqued now into the charge to dare to unknow, to unlearn how we've been bound up into ourselves? Is it a freedom caught up even against itself in a humanist allergy to the obligations of relational influence and social constraint? Huffer notes that the erotic ethical practice of freedom will not show up on a syllabus or in a textbook. It is undisciplined, unappropriable. Maybe it's inappropriate too, but this doesn't mean it's apolitical. In her next section, another take on ethics, Huffer orients the work of erosive self-hollowing, quote, to something larger than the self, like a gully to rainstorms, season after season, unquote, or like a self to its larger social context, we might say, day after day, relentlessly. The erotic ethical practice of freedom is aimed at the self, but does not neglect the other or others with whom the self is in relation. This question of relationality leads Huffer to cite Cynthia Willett's claim that, quote, the erotic capacity for sustained relation is a kind of freedom, unquote. Indeed, quote, freedom's most sublime meaning is eros, unquote, according to Willett. Huffer and Foucault agree, but with the caveat that the sustained relationality that constitutes freedom is not about unity or attunement, but about dissonance and disconnection. Freedom is sustained relationality that works on the self and doesn't tell others what to do. We can begin to feel the shape of Huffer's arrows, her prowling practice of self-erosion, this concrete ethical practice that enacts freedom. In the short section called Back to Eros, Huffer coils about the pre-verbal verbiness of Eros to tell us that it, art, quote, articulates something other than discipline, something other than domination, something other than catastrophic morality, unquote. She goes on, Foucault calls that something other practices of freedom, and those practices of freedom cohere and dissolve us, unquote. Eros here is a practice that articulates. It articulates alternatives or something other. It is a practice of articulating our alternatives to negative forces of self-construction or subjectivation. So is freedom the space left after the negative bindings of discipline, domination, and catastrophic morality are hollowed out? It is at this point in the section Eros Undisciplined that Hoffer takes up Herbert Marcuse's Freudian Marxian text Eros and Civilization and its relationship to Foucault's history of sexuality and history of madness. Huffer aims here to de-disciplinize the relation between these thinkers. She wishes to erode the forces of disciplinary power that extract the words and writings of thinkers and tosses them into an academic capture that cubbyholes reifies and tames them. Her engagement with Marcuse and Foucault demonstrates erotic ethics by pointing out the academic politics of citation that make us scholars, by showing how we are bound to academic disciplines and bound in academic disciplines, when instead she seeks a scholarly dissolution of discipline that transgresses the lines that make up Marcuse or Foucault, not by opposing them, but by suspending them. Instead of ceding to the pressure to position herself on an either or plane, either Marcuse and Foucault are diametrically opposed or they can be fully harmonized to each other. Huffer explores, quote, what conceptual or preconceptual possibilities emerge if we look at the way Marcusean Eros gives a discursive and overtly political form 
to what Foucault presents as a formless murmur, unquote. Well, one conceptual possibility lies in their shared investment in Nietzsche. The crucial factor in this investment is time. Both Marcuse and Foucault find in Nietzsche a forceful account of how the wounds of the past do, do persist in the words, values, institutions, and practices of the present, molding and distorting our ideas and pooling one's sexual identity, for example, into lockstep agreement or opposition to social norms and away from the felt possibilities of erotic life. This focus on temporality, on how humans develop within time and how time itself is a technology that captures life leads me to see Marx as a silent mediator between Marcuse and Foucault. It is from Marx that these thinkers of Eros have learned that the extraction of individuality from life and of capitalist labor from human material sensuous activity is a particular formation of capitalism. It is a form that in Foucault's powerful words reduces the time of life to the time of labor. But though it is historically dominant and relentless, capitalism is not necessary. It is not the only way for humans to live together. Freedom for Marx is always about this non-necessity and always about the temporal capture of life's possibilities. He sardonically depicts the freedom of the market, for instance, as a double negative. A potential employee is free for the market, that is for exploitation, only because they have already been violently freed from property by social events and policies that keep them poor. Humans today cannot not work unless we already have the money and property to excuse ourselves from the market. Communist freedom would be the specific release from the fetters of bourgeois freedom that are anchored in specific property and power relations. Marx writes about freedom as a violent revolutionary task of wrenching power away from those who would wield it over the many in order to protect the capacities for human flourishing only for the few. Marx does not shy away from telling other people what to do. Hoffer's Foucauldian eth erotic ethical practices of freedom are also violent, I think, but on the scale of the self and toward a stylistic rearrangement of words and habits that are not personal because they are aimed at, quote, inventing a possibility of life, a way of existing, in the words of Deleuze, that is, in inventing a modality, not an idiosyncrasy. I can imagine a concrete example here, that of gender. The more I lean into trans theory and talk with trans students, the less I am attached to gender pronouns at all for anyone. Let's just toss out he and she and call everyone they. This is an, a statement and assertion that arises from a style of questioning, a style of self unbinding, a style of life. And it could well be a kind of politics, one that in refusing certain words and embracing a different self comportment might fundamentally change the world. And yet we could not hope or expect that this change would simply blossom without resistance, indeed, without large scale violence. So that eventually the political fight for Eros cannot remain quite so restricted to erosive words and practices of self unbinding, however impersonal. But I think this political thought experiment means we might not, we might need to forfeit our investment in freedom as a term or a practice. For our burning up, extinction prone, fascist saturated, anti black, anti indigenous, soberly cis het world besieged by a virus we cannot see, we might need to drop freedom and transvalue words such as obligation, imbrication, and restraint. Would this be an erotic politics? I would hope so. Something like a politics of binding without selves, of dissolving the self in high stake commitments for human and non-human others, for the sake of the commons, for the sake of the planet. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Gail. And thank you also to Emily. My internet briefly uh, got a little shifty and Emily jumped in um, to help. So thank you so much. Um, next, I'm delighted to introduce Taryn Jordan. Taryn D. Jordan is a postdoctoral fellow in women's studies at Colgate University. Taryn recently completed her PhD in, w in women's gender and sexuality studies at Emory University. And before that, an MA at Georgia State University. Uh, her research interests lie in blackness, decolonial theory, political economy, queer theory, and affect theory. Taryn has invested her life in social justice work. 
She seeks to blend her political work and academic interests in a productive relationship where struggle and theory mutually inform one another, creating the conditions for an intellectual and political spiral. Welcome, Taryn. Thank you uh, so much, Lauren, for your warm reception. Um, in preparation for this, I talked with Lynn a couple of weeks ago and she asked me what section I was actually gonna be responding to. And I told her in my very undisciplined blackness that I was gonna to respond to whatever I felt like. Um, so in a spirit of sort of lies and this men in a spirit of thinking through taste as a kind of uh, experience of the archive, I wanna kind of move through um, Lynn's work and the relationship I have to it as well. So thank you, Lynn, for letting me be a little undisciplined, as always. This book, your book of strange arrows as an event, or what you characterize as a book event, and your first book of this trilogy, Mad for Foucault, you say, quote, in his marvelous self-ironizing preface to the 1972 French revised edition of Madness, Foucault describes his book as an object event. The violence of the preface is a humble one, the voice of the preface is a humble one. The event is minuscule, almost imperceptible among so many others, an object that fits into the hand." Unquote. As humble object, the book must take care to avoid speaking with the weight or solemnity of a text. Rather, it should have the lightness, the attitude of disengagement or abandon to present itself as a discourse releasing itself from the literary and philosophical traditions alike. Rejecting the book as text, the already coded, received, and ordered canonical tradition of books solidly implanted in libraries, fields of criticism, and pedagogical systems. Foucault chooses instead the book as discourse, the object event that, like a weapon, ruptures tradition with the force of an opening in history." End quote. Later on, you go on to say more about events in the same train of thought in that book, and this one's shorter. Eventualization links history with philosophy through the concept of the double and the doubling bring out the political dimension of the object event as just one moment in a repetitive bringing to light of the rupture of evidence. The book as event takes its place in an incessant game of repetitions. These doublings in turn form part of what Foucault will always refer to as games of truth." End quote. I find your description of the book event illuminating. What you have offered us is precisely an event by way of your own erotic encounter with Foucault, what you so aptly titled Foucault's Strange Arrows. This book, much like many other book events, emerges through a usurpation, a vocabulary taken up again and turned back against its users. Through Eros, you have confiscated Foucault from the various permutations of him that want to discipline him into philosopher or historian, or want to capture his work into one intellectual camp or another, structuralist or post-structuralist, have you, or charge that discourse could never be more than speech, thus rendering discourse immaterial. Yet you, you, you view Foucault queerly with a devotion that watches, prowling in the dark, waiting for the flickers of light in his archive. Your book, your book event, Foucault's Strange Arrows, presents him to all of us as a constellation of fractures, Foucault in your illumination is part philosopher, part bad historian. He who walks the edges of philosophy's excess as poetry, rendering him through your own backward looking glance through a horizontal plan of relation alongside Vitig's lesbian body, the lesbian body of your mother before you and your own fragmentation signaling the gaps, abysses between words through a poetic use of brackets. Through genealogy, a discontinuous history of Eros, you render Foucault a maternal poet, obsessed with births and writing over corpses. Implicitly, your questioning rearranges Foucault into an unlikely foremother of queer feminisms, masking him as a maternal poet in your own writing over the body of history that Foucault himself has wrought. In my very brief comments today, I wanna to discuss how Lynn's strange arrows doubles in my own work, and I'll finish on some questions that came up for me in reading your book. Importantly, your book, your book event emerges for me as a black feminist theorist and genealogist as a weapon. In my own production of a counter counter history of soul that traces through modernity's black history, my work has already produced a double in response to your work on Foucault's strange arrows. 
I think the question that organizes my thinking with and alongside Huffer is what is the relationship, if any, between blackness and Eros? Is there such thing as black Eros? This mode of questioning is in line with your post-moral ethics of questioning that you describe as the very ethics of Eros. The ethics of Eros, it's much less a telling what one to do, but rather a mode of questioning that puts the system of values that led to the question into question in the first place. However, you materialize this question to what you call, quote, Foucault's disciplined, undisciplined Eros, end quote. It is a response to the question that I organize much of Foucault's thinking, it is a response to this question that I organize much of Foucault's thinking, your thinking and my own. You ask ever so slightly in all of your work, how are we to live? Or more precisely in the book, you ask a question that annotates strange arrows, quote, how will we breathe? And Lynn and I both know that breath is a sort of signifier in the long sort of etymology of soul, which connects us in strange disconnect continuities as well. How are we to breathe inside the techno grid that puts under surveillance and turns each of us in our own turn into ever more effective surveillance who keep track of ourselves and others as so many forms of life, as memes and selfies, as internet ad junkies, as panoptical iWatch wearers, as GPS driven motorists stuck to the grid, my arrows teach us to veer off course, to get lost, end quote. In my own getting lost in the arrows, your fragmented production of Foucault, I stumbled upon what I tentatively call black arrows. And this is my own work in relation to Len. Black love emerges in the resounding vibrations in my archive of soul. I conceive of love as strange arrows, what Lynn Huffer conceptualizes as a poetics of unreason. And this is directly from Lynn, and this is coming from an older version of the book. So the quote might be slightly off. I, I was able to happily see it in its draft form. Distinct from madness, unreason is the term Foucault offers in history of madness for a strange murmuring, background noise, or brute defond, out of which reason extracts the language of madness and turns the mad into objects of science. Five years later, in the thought of the outside, Foucault calls the murmurs the outside. To ask about Foucault's strange arrows is to ask about that outside, a difficult concept if we take into heart Foucault's more famous claim that there is no outside. As I conceive it, the thought of Foucault's arrows is the thought of the outside, where thinking refers to something other than the bringing of concepts into the interiority of the mind. The murmur of arrows as the outside invites a focus in how Foucault's writing opens towards the erosion of the interiority of thinking, of the interiority of the thinking subject, end quote. And just briefly, my work on soul is an attempt to sort of grapple with an affect theory that's focused on the human that is often rendered as white. And so an attempt to think about soul, I wanna think about black, the Black's exclusion from the human. And Huffer's use of arrows allows me to sort of play with this idea of exclusion as both an inside and an outside. Moving on, returning to the work. Of importance in Huffer's conceptualization of Foucault's poetic unreason is her emphasis on sound. Huffer is clear. Unreason is the term Foucault offers in History of Madness for a strange murmuring background noise or brut de fond, out of which reason extracts the language of madness and turns the mad into objects of science. Since unreason's inarticulate sound objectifies the mad into a stable, knowable objects, Huffer's conceptualization of strange eros as unreason, that is the background sound to modernity's will to know, positions sound as the condition of possibility for eros. Even more in Huffer's work, she focuses on how, quote, how Foucault's opening, Foucault's writing opens toward the erosion of the interior of the thinking subject, end quote. Huffer's rereading of Eros as the outside of thought that erodes the difference between interiority and exterior provides a compelling basis for thinking about what I want to conceive as Black love. Since Blacks are excluded from the human, according to Winter, they're considered to be in an early modern period, quote, purely sensory beings, end quote. The tension between interiority and exteriority here is important insofar as the history of the Black's exclusion from the human shows an understanding of love dependent upon the sound of unreason. Black love undoes the interiority of consciousness by not resisting the violent exteriorization of Black consciousness. Black consciousness is exteriorized through the violent policing of the color line that splits the Black soul. During this encounter, the Black soul produces a veil that covers over the Black world, Black consciousness externalized is not an effect of an agential action, 
you know, very much echoes of Lynn's sort of, you know, conception of, of Eros as a kind of a gentle without an agent, as a force. Instead, Black consciousness is externalized through violent techniques. By living with this exclusion, Black love is materialized through the collecting of objects, details, histories that tell a tale of Black endurance in an anti-Black world. As a result, I rearranged Wilderson's question, would a nothing ever be if a nothing again, to ask, can a nothing love another nothing, or simply, can objects love? My question is loaded with dread of Black love that my reading of Wilderson's unanswered question provides. In light of this dread, I feel, and the many stories of Black death in our present, asking questions about love feels trivial. Love in the broad schema of Black living, despite, beside, and with anti-Blackness is overlooked or considered inessential, yet love is key to Black endurance. Black love's importance, and here I'm just gonna riff a little on love and then I'll return to Lynn. Black love's importance is the object's speech. Wilderson's words are painful, but he was able to speak them as a testament to the importance of the object's speech to Black history and culture. Reading Huffer's Strange Eros as a murmur of Foucault's poetics of unreasons with Fred Moten's conceptualization of the value of the object's speech, Black speech comes to stand in as love in the archive. Moten argues that the value of the Black object is produced prior to the exchange in the object's speech. Through a close reading of Marx's comments on the object's inability to speak, Moten claims Marx asserts that the impossibility of the object's speech in two ways. First, he reproduces the speech of the dumb commodities by saying our use value may be interest to mend, but it does not belong to us as objects. What does belong to us as objects, however, is our value. Our own intercourse as commodities proves it. We relate to each other merely as exchange value. And second, the object's speech, Marx reproduces in the performance of the econo economist, quote, riches, use value, are the attribute of man. Value is the attribute of commodities. A man or a commodity is rich. A pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or a diamond, end quote. Moton's critique of what he calls Marx's dual ventriloquizations contradicts each other insofar as Marx does not come down on either side of his stage debate. Rather, Marx traverses what he conceives of as an empty space between the two of them. Moton calls this space, quote, the material substance of the commodity's impossible speech, end quote. While Moton is interested in the inherent value of the object's speech, I'm much more interested in what it what's at stake for Moton in his reading of Marx. For Moton, what is important is not what the object says, but rather that the object speaks at all. The fact that the object speaks is evidence of its relation prior to exchange on the market, producing a shared value for the object through their speech. Bringing Huffer's reading of Strange Arrows back into focus with Moton, Black speech is the background sound of unreason. Black love is produced in the object's vocal exchange. This mode of exchange erodes the interior of thought and manifests outside of reason that articulates itself through feeling. This inarticulate noise is the condition of possibility for Black love to emerge in an archive of soul. So I guess in response to this book event that doubles within me and the many doubles I negotiate through a sort of double consciousness that soul gives us. As a black feminist who renders Foucault black in my own fragmentation of his method and his work on soul, I have three questions for Lynn. One, I found blackness haunting your work in reference to the evil genius and the debates between Derrida and Foucault. Even more, blackness as illegibility emerged in your discussion of Foucault's reference to the black, blocks, black, black box of intelligibility in his discussion of prison work. Can you say more about these dark figures in your work since in my own reading, they resonate as shadows produced through the stereoscopic work of Eros, which in a larger frame of, of Moton and other black critical thinkers renders blackness de-articulated from a body. Second, in your chapter on Foucault's anti-prison work, you said the politics of Eros is materialized through the speech of the prisoners that Foucault is much critiqued for reproducing or sort of organizing in his many pamphlets. I too take up speech as a form of feeling, as a kind of politics outside the social contract in black worlds. But the question that haunts me, and I guess the question I have for you, especially considering the world we're in, in a summer immediately following another rampage of black uprising, is speech enough, right? This is a question that haunts me on a regular basis as someone who's experienced and organized in communities through a kind of Marxist frame, is speech enough? 
And as a black feminist theorist, he uses Foucault with Du Bois and Winter and Angela Davis through a kind of active interpretation and sort of flexing and rearranging my own fragmented version of Foucault to produce a sort of differing system of affect outside of the human that wants to resist naming affects definitions, which I, I know you are very well much familiar with. Can you say more about your use of Sylvan Tompkins to describe the affect of startling? Why Tompkins, right? In some ways, lies and emphasis men very much sort of draws upon taste, feeling, affect that, that Foucault doesn't necessarily explain. So why explain? the affect of startle when, af when startling in of itself is a surprise. Regardless of these responses to these questions, it has been truly an honor, Lynn, to learn from you and work the edges of our doubled approaches to Eros, Foucault, and the various permutations in between. I found the text to be incredibly generous, and at times I could hear you speaking um, in your classroom, in your office. And so thank you for this work and thank you for the trilogy because it's something I need to sit with for a long time. That's it, that's all I got. Thank you so much, Taryn. Um, that was beautiful, um, both so far. I'm, I've also just uh, it, I've invited some of my favorite people to listen to talk about a book that I love. So this is such a treat. Um, next, Emily will introduce Perry. So Perry Zern is assistant professor of philosophy at American University. His forthcoming monograph is titled Curiosity and Power, the Politics of Inquiry. And he is co-editor of Active Intolerance, Michel Foucault, the Prisons Information Group and the Future of Abolition and Curiosity Studies, a New Ecology of Knowledge. He is also co-editor of the forthcoming volume Intolerable Writings from Michel Foucault and the Prisons Information Group 1970 to 1980. This year, he was one of the co-organizers of the Thinking Trans Trans Thinking Conference hosted virtually in October by UT Austin. His work appears in the APA newsletter on LGBT issues in philosophy, carceral notebooks, Hypatia, Philosophia, Radical Philosophy Review, and other journals. Thank you for joining us. Um, thanks so much, Emily, for the kind introduction. I'm really honored to be part of this panel, book panel on Lynn Huffer's Foucault's Strange Eros. My uh, partner first misread the uh, title to be Foucault's Strange Ears, which I find altogether appropriate and delightful given the emphasis on listening throughout. A huge thanks to Lauren Gilmet uh, for organizing and to my fellow panelists, Gail Hemner, uh, Celine Ishlatel, and Taryn Jordan, uh, and to Lynn herself for writing this book. I really appreciate being in conversation. My remarks today. Um, well, when Lauren first invited me to be part of this panel, she mentioned that my quote, perspective on the fourth chapter, unquote, would be welcome. I'm lucky to have read an earlier version of this chapter, and in fact, to have published it in the first English language collection on the Jeep archive, Active Intolerance, uh, mentioned before, which I coded with Andrew Diltz in 2016. And I must say, having done an uh, extensive editorial work that, um, Lynn was absolutely delightful to work with and a real pleasure as a contributor to that project. The generosity of her readings and the effusiveness of her writing carry over into her collegiality uh, and her collaboration. So we counted ourselves lucky that she was in the book. As prompted then, I'd like to make a few remarks on the Jeep chapter um, entitled Prowling Eros, remarks that have a bearing on broader, I think, invitations embedded throughout the volume. Specifically, I'll be playing with, in the background, um, the, the distance between, what, how extensive is the distance between eros and sexuality, between unreason and reason, between science and poetry? So I wanna figure out how expansive or small that distance is. I should remark a huge thanks to Kevin Thompson. I believe he's in the audience. I would not have fallen into the Jeep trap without his invitation um, a good 10 years ago. So thanks, Kevin. First remark on prowling. Prowling for Huffer is a methodological technique, part of the arsenal or the toolbox of Foucault's ethopoetic method. But Huffer too has an ethopoetic method and she too deploys this technique to catch a glint of Foucault's. As she explains, to prowl is related to the, an old French word meaning to rave, to show signs of madness, to dream, 
and to wander here or there. As such, prowling refuses a certain reason and a certain rationality. It seeks neither the warm illumination of wonder nor the crisp light of curiosity it gropes in the dark. Part of the impetus for Huffer in prowling the archive is to channel unreason and eros against the extractions of reason and sexuality, the making sane, the making speak, and the making straight. And even uh, more than its anti-disciplinary tones, the erotic overtones of prowling ought not to be missed. For a queer of a certain age, it's hard not to hear Rents musicals uh, Mimi singing, you wanna prowl, be my night owl. We'll take my hand, we're gonna howl tonight. Couldn't help it. In this discussion and deployment of prowling and its madness as an ethopoetic uh, technique, what I wanted, what I listened for, the murmur I craned to hear was a reference to mad studies. I wanted to hear how manifesting madness or being on the prowl is different for the abled and the enabled than it is for those already counted or accounted mad. It's a haunting absence in light of the rise of mad studies and disability analyses in critical prison studies. I'm thinking especially of Lydia XC Brown and Liat Ben Moshe. Huffer might respond by warning me that the call to attend to the mad identified falls precisely into the trap uh, of identity politics so carefully crafted by a reason that over distinguishes and over extracts. And given the investments of this project, I really hear that. Um, but if Huffer is concerned, as I take her to be, with the textures that are lost in the light of reason, are not the textures among the practitioners of madness one of those lost things? Mustn't we grope and prowl to discern not only the differences in positionality, but in perception and perceptibility? Isn't this muddiness precisely that to which prowling invites us to attend? And what wisdoms are to be found in mad studies and among the mad for an ethopoetics on the prowl? Second remark, the enquête. Huffer contextualizes the Jeep project within Foucault's 1972 critique of the enquête as developed in his penal theories and institutions lectures. There he describes the enquête as inquisitorial, an inquisitorial mode of knowing which practices the extraction, displacement, and accumulation of knowledge. Embedded in a certain imperial sovereignty, the enquête uses, and I'm quoting um, Huffer here, rationalized data gathering methods, unquote, to clearly, to see clearly, cleanly, and to decide the essence of its object. The Jeep, as I think I understand it for Huffer, resists precisely this move, precisely this enquête. It aims to know with the ear, perhaps, rather than to decide with the eye, to attend to rather than to analyze, to collectivize rather than calculate. As such, the Jeep's counter archive, as Huffer puts it, is an untimely, undisciplined, erotic record of lost voices and indistinct murmurs. And yet I also want to be attentive here to the Jeep's own embrace of the term enquête. Early in 1971, the Jeep announced itself as conducting its first inquiry, its first enquête. And as they characterize it, quote, it is not a sociological inquiry. It is an intolerance inquiry, unquote. That is not an enquête sociologique, but an en enquête intolérance. That intolerance inquiry became their first publication, a booklet, booklet that was entitled Enquête, or Investigation into 20 Prisons edited by Christine Martineau and Danielle Ranciere alongside Michel Foucault and Daniel Defer, the booklet's preface characterizes the Jeep enquête as distinct in at least four ways. It is designed as an attack. It aims at specific targets. It gathers previously segregated social strata. And most importantly, it comes not from the outside, but from the inside. Prisoners and former prisoners themselves helped develop the draft questionnaires. In this sense, the Jeep enquête builds on the Marxist enquête deployed in labor organizing, as well as a much longer genealogy explored in Marcelo Hoffman's recent book, Militant Acts, The Role of Investigations or Enquêtes in Radical Political Struggles out in 2019. Thus, I see a certain Jeep reclamation and redeployment of the word in the mundane arts of questionnaires. It seems that we need more um, than a contrast between the enquête and the prowl here. In practice, there seems to be something in between, and I would invite um, 
you to perhaps speak to that. Third and final remark, the desert. Hopefully here's the Jeep counter archive carried in the lilt of a line from HM, a queer, crip, incarcerated figure who took his own life, but not before writing insistent letters to his lover, which the Jeep later published. In his letters, H.M. writes, as Huffer translates it, I am a voice that calls out in the desert. As Huffer interprets the line, H.M. is crying out in the desert of the prison, in the desert of repeated solitary confinements, raising a voiceless voice in the vast underbelly of French society. And as such, H.M.'s line signals, I believe for Huffer, the quote, not speech of the thought of the outside, unquote an indistinct murmur, always already vanishing, that as such can only be prowled and watched over in the quietness of its passing. I interpret this line, I should say, your writing has invited me to hang out with this line longer and I feel like I'm seeing a few new things. As someone raised in the Christian tradition, I can't help but hear an echo of John the Baptist, writing, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John 1, 23, and of the prophet Isaiah before him, announcing the voice of one who would cry in the wilderness, Isaiah 43. Indeed, H.M. uses the same locution as that which appears in the French Bible at the time, je suis la voix qui crie dans le désert. And while this is not the only time that H.M. cribs a line from the Bible, it's important to acknowledge that these references are vastly outnumbered uh, by his nods to John Lennon. This context strikes me as critical to an interpretation of the passage. H.M. is explicitly and perhaps fundamentally archiving himself in one of the longest, most heavily analyzed of all archives, that of the Judeo-Christian faith. In so doing, he seems to lend credence and perhaps even clarity to his voice, sharpening it. It might be then less of a testament to erasure than it is a protest, an insistence on meaning making, belonging, and even hope within and against a system that aims to quell precisely that meaning, that belonging, and that hope. So permit me a brief pivot into theology. As testified by the prophet Isaiah, John the Baptist cried out in the wilderness on the cusp of Jesus's first coming. Across the Old and New Testaments, the wilderness is then a waiting ground that precipitates revelation. The same word is used to refer to the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years uh, before they inherited the promised land. That waiting ground, moreover, is typically a place of political exile and even social abandonment. But it is consistently also a place of unusually intimate companionship with the divine. As such, the very notion of belonging is reframed in the liminal space of the wilderness. God appears to his people in a pillar of fire, a voice on the mountaintop, a wind outside Elijah's cave, and in a burning bush. And it is here in this space of abandonment and yet belonging that the Old and New Testament prophets find their voice. It's standing here on the outskirts of empire that they cry out their critique of empire, proclaiming a kingdom not of this world. The Greek word for wilderness, eremos, which typically refers to an uncultivated, unpopulated place or an unappropriated territory, captures this anti-imperial, dare I say anti-carceral, position of the wilderness. The letter in which H.M.'s cry from the wilderness is inscribed is dated September 9th, 1972. It begins with a deep frustration common to many prisoners that he writes and he writes, but he barely ever receives mail. H.M. begs his friend S. to please write something, to please write regularly, so as to remind H.M. that he is, quote, not all alone, unquote. The letter then describes the kind of furtive companionship that H.M. is building in the prison with his doctor, his psychiatrist, his cellmate, the arrival of a new cellmate, and a book, and the community he hopes to be a part of upon release, a communitarian hideaway, a small farmhouse, a goat, and a few sheep. H.M. then launches a clear anti-carceral screed at the end of the letter. Insistently, brazenly, he speaks, quote, society has rejected me, but I'll survive without it. It can't harm me anymore. I will howl injustice. I will proclaim the corruption of the police and their barbaric and arbitrary methods. Whatever it costs me, I will speak the truth, unquote. 
This is H.M. the prophet. This is H.M. speaking from exile, yes, but also after drawing strength from insurgent intimacies and forbidden belongings. As he speaks truth to power, he insists that carceral space is never total or totalizing. There is a deterritorializing wilderness even here in the friend prison. It is indeed in his furtive sociality and his howling, even piercing speech in the cracks of carceral expansion that H.M. embodies, like the prophets of old, a certain abolitionist practice. I wonder, I suppose, what Huffer makes of this deeper context. Thanks. And fourth, I am delighted. So thank you so much, Perry. Uh, such suggestive and rich comments. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, Lynn's responses to all of these. Um, fourth, I am delighted to introduce Celine Ishlakel, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Fordham University. Her current book project is titled Nightmare Knowledges, Necropolitics of Mourning and Genealogies of Disappearance. Her articles include Traveling the Soil of Words, of world, excuse me, trauma and opacity in decolonial feminisms from Hypatia this year, and also absent death, necropolitics and the practices of mourning from Philosophia in 2017. She is also co-editing a volume on Foucault, Derrida and the biopolitics of punishment. Welcome, Celine. Hello, everyone. It really is a, it's an honor to be here. And so I would like to start by thanking everyone. Uh, first, thank you. Lauren for organizing this and organizing the workshop. It's been, uh, it is an honor to be here, as I said, and it's been a pleasure really to, to be in engagement with everyone. I would like to thank uh, my panelists, my co-panelists for incredibly insightful readings. And as I was listening, every single one of you, I wanted to go back, read and think more as well. So thank you very much for that. And most of all, of course, thank you, Lynn, for writing this book and for giving us all so much to think about, so much to dwell on and so much to dwell with. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and go ahead and talk about my comments here. Foucault's Strange Eros is a beautiful and strange book. It is beautiful in fragments and brackets. It is beautiful with cuts and, and, and phrases. And we travel with Huffer as she moves between the heterotopias of the archive, as she excavates and experiments with Foucault's eros. It is strange in the sense that Lynn uses here, where in and through these travels, we become a little bit strange to ourselves, a, a little bit strange to Foucault, and Foucault becomes a little bit, bit strange to us as well. So in this book, uh, Huffer does multiple things at once. She develops Eros as an experience, as experiencing the thought of the outside, as a moving ground out of which sexuality has been extracted and provides a meditation of sorts of what it means to encounter this Eros. Eros is sexuality as unreason as to madness, Huffer says to Raph. The task at hand is to, is to question what does it mean to hear Eros or understand Eros? whether the ver very categories of hearing, speaking, or understanding are possible categories when it comes to Paris. In this meditation, we see Huffer encountering Foucault anew through his etopoiesis. Here, Foucault, uh, the corpus and the corpse, and the archive of Foucault, and the machinery of intellectual production around Foucault becomes strange as well. Additionally, here, Huffer provides a methodology of sorts of engaging with archive in this work, a way of listening to the murmur of the archive, or maybe the archive, so an archive or the archive, and un it's decided that, that is constituted by violence and the ground of which is continuously moving and continuously violent. So a methodology we have of keeping watch of this archive that consists of bending over and listening to its murmur. That is less than language, she says, keeping watch of what is continuously in the process of passing and disappearing. My main two questions here will focus on the archive on the one hand and the rituals of keeping watch and death watching on the other hand. And I should say uh, some of these questions did already come up in our conversations, but I also want uh, Lynn to talk more about these as well. 
So first, uh, regarding the archive and what counts, or rather what doesn't count as the archive. The very introduction of Foucault's Strange Eros describes two senses of the archive. First, the archive as a site, as a place where one goes to and one goes in, and the other as the unseen and the abstract operating system, that is, quote, an episteme's condition of an intelligibility, end quote, page seven. This grid of intelligibility shapes the terms of speech through extracting figures and modes of power out of the moving ground of eros. It is a violent archive and an archive of violence at once. The engagement with this kind of an archive makes, present, makes it present strange. Moreover, Huff, Lynn Huffer says here that this dual sense of the archive is heterotopian, as these two poles do not quote, cohere into the unity of an understanding. Quote. So I'm curious to hear about this heterotopian relation on the question of, well, what counts as an archive, specifically regarding how much of the encounter with the second sense of the archive as a condition of the intelligibility depend on a relation with the first one as a certain type of archive, that is, an archive that has documents in them, an archive that is officially registered as an archive. Many archives in the plural discussed in the book are attached to specific locations and our written archives are documented archives. We have the Jeep archive, uh, mentions of IMEG, we have Anne Carson Sapphic archive, Wittig's archive. So I wonder what would happen if we were to split off these two senses of the archive and what would happen to arrows and how the erosion of the self that is arrows would uh, relate to and works with non-written or non-documented archives. For me, this is important in thinking of the violence of archives in the, in the plural archives in general. In so far as the very existence of written or documental archives is a process of extraction as well. In the asylum records, for example, we see the written marks of the lives of infamous men and the terms of the grid of intelligibility that mark them. And yet, much of the archive in the second sense as a grid of intelligibility consists of what is not there in the archive or what does not make to the archives in the first place. Many of the sites of power that has crushed the infamous men that Foucault is talking about have been erased and many of them never made it to getting those lines either. So uh, moreover, much of what even counts as an archival site, whether the documents exist, whether the site exists, what, uh, whether whatever and whomever lived and died rose to the threshold of having or being a part of the archive is a, is a question of the part of extraction as well. So this, the possibility of eros or an erotic encounter in relation to non-written archives is also important in considering the limits of archives and the production of counter archives. As Lynn Hufford discusses, there are various limitations in the possibility of encountering the archive or in her words, quote, that the experience of the archive is an experience conditioned by the a priori. Those conditions of the historical a priori also involve the conditions of the possibility of archives. As discussed in chapter four, for example, sovereignty returning in biopower as vile sovereignty produces silences in biopower. So this is also an invitation to speak about those silences that emerge from the disqualification of non-written archives and the murmurs of memories, bodies, and spaces. As a whole, my question is, well, what happens to Eros when we shift our gaze from the privileged sites of written archives to those that are disqualified from counting as such? For example, is it possible to co consider the archive in the second se sense as the grid of intelligibility and an, and an erotic encounter with this pertaining to non-written archives, bodies, memories, sites, cities, soil, oceans, rivers, or wells? One possibility of non-written archives comes up in the very last chapter, where through Wattig and Benveniste, the earth, and the earth emerges as a monster's corpse, like the corpses of Foucault's analysis. 
but that are st still seems wrapped up in the archives of Boutique, for example, or Sappho, or An Anne Carson. So this is an invitation of what erotic encounters would, ar would archive look like in the context of things that are not usually considered as archives when there is no site to enter. And similarly, what does Eros feel like when we are thinking about archives that are not there, there of events that did not take place? And uh, again, this is this partially came up in our conversations, but I, I really would like to hear you more talk, talk more about this as well. Um, speaking of corpses, uh, my second question is an invitation to speak about the relation between eros and death, and specifically about rituals of death and relations to corpses. This relation to eros comes up various times throughout the text. In a way, um, this kind of a relation that there is a relation between Eros, death and archive is a familiar relation. For example, Derrida talks about, discusses the archive in relation to the death drive that marks both what drives one to the archive in, in the first place as, an, as a kind of curiosity with the archive to be driven by death into the archive, but also about the forgettings and ruptures within the archive that the archive is interrupted, that the archive is constituted by forgettings. As it comes up various times in Foucault's Strange Eros as well, Foucault discusses his own writing and his own archive as Foucault having to deal with the death of others as an act of speaking over the corpse of others, end quote. This is from Speech After Death. And it is very interesting how, how much uh, it is fascinating to see how much you dwell on these lines specifically with Foucault to right? So there's something deadly in the archive and in one's relation to archive. In Foucault's Strange Arrows, however, this relationship is strange. Arrows comes up as a way of tending to the dead, as an act of veille. Code a verb of palliative care, a caring attentive to the fact of dying without dying when the dying will come, end quote. In relation to holding vigil. In Lynn Hopper's writing, Foucault's description of himself as a, quote, astonished anatomist who becomes suddenly aware that the man on whom he was intending to demo demonstrate has woken up beneath his scalpel, end quote, takes on a different note. Foucault, as a sapphic poet, rather bends down to he hear history's violence, holds vigil over the dying of the beloved, rather than an archivist driven by death that kills in order to study, or the surprised anatomist who was perhaps a little too eager and a little too quick to assume that the subject is dead. We have the sapphic genealogist, Foucault as a sapphic genealogist, tending to the dead and dying, keeping watch of quiet deaths, such as the quiet death of H.M. in a prison cell in the Jeep archives. So I'm interested to hear uh, in general more about this shift and what it means in terms of your archival method and specifically on the relation between Eros as the erosion of the self and the death watch of Eros. First on the preliminary level about the relation between Eros as an experience as an undoing and the practice of holding vigil. It is interesting to me to hold these two thoughts together. On the one hand, arrows as an experience of undoing, and on the other hand, as arrows as a practice, it seems, as a practice of holding that vigil, doing something to keep watch of the dead. So we seem to have a practice of an experience, something that one does in order to be undone. And I'm very interested in this relationship for you. So rather than encountering the thought of the outside and the cry of an almost dead body, keeping watch and listening to the murmurs of corpses open up within the open up the encounter with arrows in the first place. So in this kind of listening, for example, an act of mourning, a ritual of watching what is gone. Or is this still a kind of curiosity? And do we have a sense of curiosity there? Like poking the corpse to see if it moves or to watching to see if it whispers. So what does that sense of holding vigil and its attentiveness do to 
both the care and the palliative care to that corpse and also to one's own relationship to that act of mourning and in relation to one's own relationship to one's own archive as well. So these are my main questions. And again, it is an honor and thank you very much for this because it has been very, it has been an honor to be in conversation with this work in many ways. And it has brought up so much of what is there in terms of death and in terms of archives in a, in a new light. And so thank you once again. I now invite a response from Dr. Lynn Huffer to these wonderful um, panelists' responses to her book. And I also encourage those who are in the audience, um, I wanna let folks know that we have a chat function and we have a Q&A. The Q&A is a really good way to go um, for posing questions. If you wanna just say hi to any of the panelists, the chat I think is the better way to go, um, but please do feel free to post those. And now I welcome a response from Lynn Huffer. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you to all who are attending this webinar. It's such an honor. Um, and I, I want to especially thank Lauren for organizing this and to thank all of my interlocutors for their incredibly insightful re readings of my work. Um, and also um, to Emily for incredibly stimulating conversation about Foucault and Hartman in particular, which is um, the object of her paper. And um, I need to let the audience know that my responses are on the fly. Like I have, I have not heard these papers before. So it's not gonna be like some beautifully co you know, coherent, seamless response where I have all my thoughts organized. Um, I hope that my remarks will be taken as stimulus for further conversation. Um, and I really am eager to hear um, thoughts from people in the audience as well, you know, through the chat function. And also I'd love to have some dialogue with the um, other people on this panel. So I'll just, I'll just start with Gail and then just go through and respond at least to some of the questions. Um, I might not be able to adequately deal with all of them, but I'll do my best. So I'm, I'm really grateful to Gail for the questions about freedom. Um, why are we invested in freedom? Who is that we? And then at the end, um, might we need to forfeit this investment in freedom? And I, I think this is such an important question. And it's interesting that um, freedom is not in the index, but I do talk about freedom. <laughs> so that's something to think about, right? <laughs> I didn't do my own index, so I'll just blame the indexer. <laughs> no, but that's, I, th I think it's very telling that it's not in the index. I think I, the first thing I'll say is that it's not an excuse, but Foucault is not a political theorist uh, in my view, right? So he's not gonna systematically give us a theory of freedom. And I think that it's important to remember that. I think Foucault is a very descriptive writer. He's describing what he sees as practices of freedom in different contexts and then the limits of those practices. And description to me is not the same as a kind of conceptual frame that's gonna allow us to understand freedom the way a political theorist would, right? That said, um, I do think that he has things to say about freedom that are interesting and important. And I mean, as a direct response to your question, I would not want to forfeit, I mean, maybe investment is the wrong word. Like, I'm not sure I wanna invest in freedom, um, but, but I think the language of freedom remains important because I think it's central to Foucault's ethics. And I think it's, central to the way he thinks about both self-relation, right? The re relation of self to oneself, not self as like a substance, but just that kind of reflexivity, I think is related to how he thinks about freedom. And also relationships with others is also part of how he thinks about freedom. I have found um, Johanna Oksala's book on freedom in Foucault to be very helpful. And one of the things that Johanna points out is that in Foucault, 
freedom is not a property. Um, it's not a condition, right? It's not a state to be achieved. And I think that's so important. It's a practice in the, in the, in the most basic sense of a practice, which means that it's historically contingent and it's shifting. And, um, you know, it's, it's this constant back and forth between, you know, how we think and what we do, right? And the other thing that I think is really important is to bring back that term suspension that I, that I talk about in the introduction, but that there's this, for Foucault, freedom has to do with coming up against limits and then what he calls the transgression as a suspension of limits. And I think that that's related to his notion of freedom. So it's not about overcoming limits. It's not about getting rid of constraints. It's about working with constraints. And in that working with constraints, that's what I mean by working the edges, working with constraints through practices that also involve thinking, one moves into some sort of transformation, right? That we can't know ahead of time. We can't know it ahead of time. It's not a blueprint, right? And I, I, I wanna um, relate that to um, this notion of a, of a poetics that I bring up you know, in my discussion of Foucault as a poet and, and to relate that to uh, other uses of poetics. And I mean, I don't bring this out directly in the book but I'm thinking of the way Fred Moten talks about poetics in his work on the undercommons, for example. Um, I think that's a, another really interesting way of thinking about a different conception of freedom that has to do again with working with constraints, right? Because I think poetry is an example of a form that is governed by constraints and yet there's a constant pushing against the constraints that's generative. And I, and I think that's a great way of thinking about freedom in Foucault. And um, in terms of Hartman, I mean, you mentioned Hartman, I just wanna to respond to a couple of these points that you made. Um, where you said, you know, freedom is not the, um, I think I think you said it's not the opposite of slavery, um, which yes, of course that's true. On the other hand, I do think that in her work, Hartman is very much invested in freedom. I mean, she talks about wayward lives as experiments in freedom. She talks about Venus in two acts. She talks about the, um, imagining a free state, right, for Venus. Um, so. So I wouldn't say that freedom is not on the radar for her. I, would, I think it's very much on the radar, but I think that brings in the question of the we, right? Whose freedom are we talking about? And what happens when, you know, freedoms bump up against each other? And how do we resolve those conflicts? And I think, again, that's something that's very much on Foucault's mind. This is not a harmonious conception of freedom. That's why I really emphasize this notion of dissonance in Foucault, because I think that dissonance is real. And I think for him, any notion of freedom that has to do with some sort of harmonizing of the we is a form of idealism, right? So it's, there's no resting point in Foucault. I think of him as a boxer who's constantly like doing this, you know, and you're constantly having to shift and, you know, I don't know the terms for boxing, but he's constantly making these movements um, in the present. And we have to be on our toes. We have to be on our toes. And it is a practice that we're constantly rethinking. So it's not freedom is unconstrained. Um, it's certainly not the freedom to unknow although I can see how you would say that, right? Um, I mean, there are privileges of unknowing, right? So it's not about, oh, let's take unknowing and turn that into the name that we're gonna give to our freedom. Again, it's about the limits between knowing and unknowing and how we bump up against those limits. And we look at how power is constructing those limits and how we ourselves are um, interrogated by and implicated in those boundaries between what we can know and what we cannot know. Um, so yeah, it's not a formula like something like the freedom to unknow, but rather a complex working of the limits that define what we even mean by knowing and unknowing. And um, the last thing I'll say, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff. I, I could talk forever like about extraction and Marcuse. I just want to say I really appreciated the focus, the attention to Marcuse because it's a tiny part of the book, but 
there's a lot of thought behind that and I really struggled with it and I've been teaching Foucault for years and you know the standard line on Marcuse is that Foucault is you know bashing Marcuse in History of Sexuality Volume 1 and as I say in the book I think it's more complicated than that and I think Eros brings that out so I appreciated the attention to Marcuse and the, the focus on that word extraction which is a word that Foucault uses that is very much a Marxist term that gets picked up by Marcuse as well. And the last thing I'll say in response to Gail is this notion of, um, you know, one of the things he says very strongly is I never tell anyone what to do. And you had said, well, Marx tells people what to do. And I think that's an interesting contrast. But I, I guess what I'd say about that in Foucault is that I think it's less like a, a moral imperative, like don't you dare tell anybody else what to do than it is just, again, descriptive, like, you can tell people what to do all you want, but it's not gonna change their behavior. <laughs> it, it feels almost like a pragmatic kind of position. Um, and, and which I think ties into um, the question that Taryn asked, and I'll get to Taryn in a minute, but is, you know, is speech enough? Like, I think sometimes we think just telling people what to do is gonna change their behavior and make everything okay, right? And I think Foucault is pointing out with that statement that it's much more complicated than that. So let me move on to Taryn. Um, Taryn, thank you so much. And um, Taryn and I have worked together for many years and it's been such a joy and it's been great to see how Taryn has um, used Foucault and this notion of Eros in relation to um, not just Fred Moten, but also um, W.E.B. Du Bois. And it's, it's a very rich project. Um, domesticity, domestic, black domestic spaces, food, cookbooks. So I really um, just, want to applaud Taryn for the great work that she's done with all of this. And I loved that you brought out this idea of the book as a humble object event. I think that's exactly how I would like my books to be taken up as both humble and object events. And I think one of the things Foucault means by that is that books are, he, he compares it to a firecracker, right, that goes off. So it's, you know, it's a firecracker. It makes a tiny little boop, you know, and then it gets like taken up into the series of events to which it belongs and it takes on a life of its own. So it's not this solid object that has a particular identity as it is an opportunity to engage in new thinking. And I think that's exactly how you use it. And I appreciate that very much. And I also think that's how Foucault wanted his books to be taken up. Um, he says that over and over again, right? Um, you know. As a, as a toolbox and so forth. And that, that notion of the disengagement of abandon um, is something that I aspire to. I, ha I have to admit that's, that's a tall order, right? There is a certain attachment to what one has written and you want people to quote, get it right. Um, but, I, but I like that idea of that disengagement of abandon and the rejection of the book as a text. And I just wanted to, comment on that for a minute because as a lot of you know I'm trained as a literary scholar. Um, I was trained in close reading um, and close reading is a very useful tool but I think one of the things that Foucault as somebody who grew up in the French tradition is responding to is what he calls the sacralization of the text, right? That the text becomes the sacred object um, to be caressed and treated um, you know like a gem or something and and you know that was very much part of the sort of French pedagogical tradition of looking at a, at a literary object and you have a certain form that you use to analyze the literary object and so forth and Foucault is very much responding against that I think when he's rejecting this idea of the book as as a text and um, and so one of the things that I really struggle with as a literary theorist is I actually think Foucault is incredibly interesting stylistically. And one of the things that I've spent a lot of time doing is using some of my tools of literary analysis to read Foucault. So free indirect discourse, for example, and how he uses that for a certain ironic voice. Um, the way in which sometimes his voice all of a sudden splits off into two voices you know, a dialogic voice, these different aspects of his writing that I think from a literary perspective are really important, but also keeping in mind that we don't wanna turn it into a sacred object. Um, so that's just a comment I wanted to make. Um, and I love it, Taryn, that you said that I confiscated Foucault. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, 
a really lovely, a, a really lovely phrase. So let me just quickly respond um, to your uh, questions about about blackness and the black box of intelligibility, um, the politics of Eros and in the speech enough, particularly in relation to speech in the Jeep. And then um, this um, brief use that I make of Sylvan Tompkins in one of the chapters where I talk about um, startle. So in terms of in terms of blackness, I mean, you and you and I have talked about this quite a bit. I mean, Foucault obviously is not a thinker of blackness in the sense of like, you know, Afro, Afro pessimism or the way, um, you know, people in critical black studies in general think about blackness. It's, it's not on his radar at all. And yet, I do think, as your work shows, that his work can be useful for thinking about blackness. Um, and I think one of the things that Foucault does is he brings um, a kind of anti-humanist, anti-foundationalist perspective to, um, his, to history, right, that is, is different than the, the focus on ontology that we see in a lot of um, Afro-pessimism, right? So I think, I think Foucault's historical perspective, which is something that somebody like Calvin Warren is gonna be really critical of, right? Because for Afro-nihilism and Afro-pessimism, I think that historical perspective and working in archives is attached to humanism. I think Foucault's capacity to bring an anti-humanist lens to this historical perspective can be very useful for thinking about blackness and anti-blackness in the ways that um, Afro-pessimists do. Um, and I'm especially thinking of like uses of Heidegger, right? Um, so that's just like a general thought, um, but I'd, I'd be curious you know, if people have other thoughts about that. Um, in terms of the politics of arrows and speech in the Jeep and is speech enough? Um, I mean, I guess just bluntly, I would say, no, I don't think it's enough. But one of the things that I try to bring out in that chapter on the Jeep is that they did have this politics of speech, right? Of giving the floor to detainees, right? That was one of their slogans. And it was a politics of speech. I think a lot of people would have said that it wasn't completely successful, right? I, there's a lot of debate about whether or not the Jeep was a failure and so forth. It didn't last very long. And a lot of people complained that it mostly gave voice to famous people like Foucault and not to the detainees themselves and so forth, right? And I think those are all legitimate questions to raise about the Jeep. The, the main point I wanna make in that chapter is regardless of what happens to that actual speech, the voice of that speech, what we do, what remains for us now is this archive, right? This archive of the activities of the Jeep, of the speech of the Jeep, the different pamphlets and so forth that Perry talked about. And I think it's worth thinking about the relation of that archive, which I call a counter archive, because the archive is this site of violence, right? So here's this counter archive. It's this archive that's put together that has this oppositional force. I mean, Perry tied it in almost to some sort of prophetic biblical kind of protest, right? So it has that force, which is why I'm calling it a counter archive. So how can we think about that counter archive in relation to politics? I think is a really interesting question, but it's not exactly the politics of speech, right? It's something else. So that's just a question I would raise in response to your question. And then the last question about startle. Um, yeah, so in that chapter on Sedgwick and Freud and Foucault, I, I bring up startle and I, I mean, I won't go through the whole argument in that chapter, but you know, I bring in Tompkins as somebody who offers this alternative to, uh, for thinking about affect an alternative to Freud and psychoanalysis and Freudian desire um, as a way to think about this affective dimension of something that's happening in Foucault. And I do think Foucault has a lot to say about affect, even though a lot of people think he doesn't. Um, and I just wanna bring attention to Lauren Gilmet's work on affect in Foucault, which I think is very rich and um, incredibly generative. So I just wanna, um, you know, bring attention to that because I think it's really important. Um, the reason I just brought up this idea of startle in Tompkins is because he says that in, in the archeology span of knowledge, he says the historical a priori is startling. He says it's a startling term. And I just, that's an affective term. And I think that's interesting. 
Um, and I think there's a strong affective dimension to Foucault's work that you see, especially in Lives of Infamous Men, where he talks about his own affective response in the archive. Um, and he can't quite pin down the feeling, right? It's, it's dread, there's, you know, he, he talks about his taste. Um, it's kind of this love hate, you feel like it's this love hate relationship with the archive. There's fear there, but there's also longing and attraction. Um, and the thing about Startle and Tompkins is Tompkins says that Startle is a circuit breaker. And I love this idea of startle as an affect that breaks some sort of cir circuit. And I won't go into like Tompkins, you know, how Tompkins thinks about affect because that's too complicated. But there's, I think there's a connection between this idea of this affect that's a circuit breaker and Foucault's focus on genealogy as a method that is about breaking circuits, about ruptures and disjunctions and so forth. So I'll just leave it there. Um, Oh, one last thing. I think it would be interesting to link all the stuff that you said about love to this idea of freedom that Gail was talking about. So this is something to think about. Perry, thank you. And um, I wanna thank you again for including me in that volume, um, which was the, the basis of this chapter that I wrote for this book about the sheep. And um, I, I, pre I very much appreciate all of your questions about um, the absence of mad studies in the book and um, the textures that would have been brought in by practitioners of madness, as you put it. Um, this idea of the enquête as um, something that's inquisitorial, but that was embraced by the Jeep. And is there something between the enquête and the prowl, as you, as you put it? And then all the stuff about this, this person who was the topic of one of the Jeep pamphlets, Ash M, um, who um, took his own life in prison, and this idea of this howling, piercing speech as a kind of voice of a, of a prophet. And I think those are all um, very, very good points. And I think what I would say about the absence of mad studies, I mean, superficial, I guess I could just say you can't do everything, but um, that's like a really superficial <laughs> response. And I think um, deeper than that is that, you know, I struggle with that voice of madness, honestly. I struggle with that voice of madness precisely for the reasons that Foucault brings out in History of Madness, right? That, that the voice of madness is the voice of reason. And um, to speak madness is to betray it. I mean, that's, that's what he says. Now, you know, so, so I think what, what, what would be involved in that would be, you know, a deeper engagement with what that practice of madness actually is and what's engaged in madness studies and how do we read madness studies through a lens that's also really skeptical of the way in which something like madness gets taken up as a study. Right. I mean, everything becomes a study, opacity studies, you know, queer studies, trans studies, madness study. I mean, you name it, it becomes studies and it becomes institutionalized in this way that I think plays into a kind of carceral rationality. Right. Um, and that's not to say that practitioners of madness are necessarily going along with that, but I think we have to be critical and suspicious of the institutional frames that take those practices and transform them into something other than what they are, if that makes any sense. Um, in terms of the enquête and um, the prowl and what's between them, that's, that's super interesting. Um, I think, you know, what I said about the, um, you know, the survey, the enquête in that chapter was primarily in response to this really strong critique of the enquête by, this, um, by somebody named uh, Cecile Briche, is that right? Yeah, Cecile Briche. And um, she's, she just bashes Foucault and the Jeep for using this, um, this um, inquisitorial technology, basically. And I think, I guess what I wanna say about that is just that it is more complicated than that. And I think that the Jeep brings that out. And as you said, it did lead to their first publication. Um, 
I wonder if it would, if it's helpful to think about the spaces between what is spoken in the enquete as something analogous to the spaces in the archive and that that's the space of the prowl, right? It's, it's kind of like the reading between the lines of the enquete. So it's not necessarily what is captured by the sociologist, right? With the question and then the answer, but it's what the reverberation between them that's unspoken, that's that space of that murmur, right? Um, that you have to listen for in some other way. That's just an initial thought about that. And then in terms of the voice of the prophet um, in the wilderness as this anti-carceral, yeah, almost biblical voice um, that becomes part of the archive. I, you know, all I can say about that is yes, yes, right? Um, yay, like to me, that's an example of the object event being taken up into the series of events to which it belongs. Bring it into abolitionism, absolutely. Bring it in there, you know? Um, that's exactly what I think the counter archive can do. So yeah, I'm on board with that. I love that howling, piercing speech, yes. And to go back to what Taryn said, it's, I don't think that's going to free us. It's not enough, but it's, it's one of the many tools that we can use, right, in our practices of freedom. And then finally to Celine, thank you for calling my book Beautiful and Strange. I love that. <laughs> um, I do think of my book as this kind of beautiful monster or something. I do. Um, and, you know, your two questions about archive as violence and then keeping watch and in particular this idea of the death watch I think is super interesting and um, so so first about the archive and I'm glad you brought out that double sense of the archive that is sometimes missed Foucault says it really explicitly in the archaeology of knowledge right that the archive is not just the place where documents are preserved right but it's also this operating system right the system of intelligibility that allows us to think what we think and to say what we say and to feel what we feel. And that dual sense is always at work for him, but they're not, um, they, they don't line up, right? Which is why I, I compare it to this heterotopia. And I, and I think that, you know, one of the things from Foucault's idea about a heterotopia that's useful is that it's both utterly real and utterly unreal. And I think that's a useful way to think about the archive as well. So on the one hand, the archive preserves these traces of people who lived and died. And it matters to Foucault that these were real people, right, who lived and died and who leave their, their traces um, in, this, in this space. But it's also utterly unreal in the sense that how we encounter those traces in the archive is historically contingent, right? It's, it's related to the sort of epi epistemic foundations of our, of, our, of, of, of our system of intelligibility and what we can um, know and what we can't know. I mean, I'm thinking of like the order of things and how different you know, historical periods have different epistemic frames. And, um, and so in that sense, it's unreal, right? Um, it's because it's abstract, it's a, it's a system of abstraction. And, um, and so I think the relation between the two is in some ways similar. I, I don't know, I have to think about this more, but I'm thinking that it's, that it's, um, it's similar to the relationship between, um, between unreason and that which is extracted out of, the, out of this background or this backdrop of unreason. Um, so, so that, there's this constant back and forth between the, the background that allows us to speak and know and the, the way the background is constantly re reforming itself depending on his, the historical contingency of that background. Um, let's see. 
And yeah, and I, I would say that that brings out then that there's two kinds of violence. So what you, your remarks helped me to see that there's two kinds of violence in the archive. There's the violence of the claw marks, right? The violence, Foucault calls them the claw marks of power. So the only reason we know about the sodomite monk who he talks about in Lives of Infamous Men is because, you know, he was arrested, right? And you could say that about detainees, right? The only reason we know about them is because of those claw marks of power. So it's the claw marks of the system of hyper visibility and surveillance and hyper documentation and all of that, right? So there's the violence of that, of the violence of that visibility, which is the violence of the archive and the way it leaves its traces. But there's the other violence, which is the violence of erasure, right? Of, of beings who pass without a trace. Um, and that's another kind of violence, I think, that is also brought out in, this, in, in the way Foucault talks about the archive. Um, and I think that relates then to your question of what happens to Eros when we shift our gaze to those who are, who are disqualified. Um, and I think it goes back to what I, what I said to Perry about madness studies, right? There's this constant tension between wanting to see, wanting to hear those who are disqualified, but then the tools that we have at our disposal for seeing and hearing are gonna distort <laughs> what we see and what we hear, right? And so I think that's what Foucault is constantly struggling with, which gets back to the two senses of the archive that I'm talking about, right? The system of intelligibility itself is part of this, of this problem, which is why history of madness to me is so important, right? And then, um, I don't know what Eros feels like in relation to events that did not take place. I do not know how to answer that question. I'm curious if anybody else does. I, I, I literally don't know what it feels like. And I actually think part of the, what's disquieting about Foucault is that we don't always know how to feel when we read him. Um, in terms of the relation to death, and then I'll stop. And yeah, this idea of dealing with the deaths of others and this shift that you notice is so helpful towards attending to death and keeping watch over the dead, and, but even holding vigil over those who are dying. And I, I really um, am grateful to you for bringing that out because I didn't see that shift myself. And um, I think I think what what's happening there is um, I've been spending more time thinking about what happens in that space of the edge or the cut, or the break, whatever you want to call that thing that's in Foucault that looks like an edge, right? That's part of his genealogical method, right? The rupture. And I think for a long time, I thought about that as just, you know, a cut, like a line, like it's, it's like an end, it's over, right? And the more I've worked on Foucault, the more I've seen that edge as something that actually can dilate and there's more to it, right? So it's, it's, um, it's an emptiness, but it's not nothing. It's, it's empty and peopled to use Foucault's phrase, right? And so that empty but peopled is a kind of in-between time that's not quite alive and not quite dead that I think is really interesting to think about in Foucault. And so that's why I use that image of holding vigil. Um, and, you know, and, and the, the word itself in French is really important to me, which is veiller, right? Um, to keep watch. And that has the same root as surveiller, as in surveiller et, et punir, discipline and punish, surveillance, right? The sur is the watching over in this notion of surveillance. The veiller is horizontal. It's literally I'm next to somebody, right? And, I, and to me, that's another, it's a counter um, movement, a counter practice 
to the movement of surveillance. Um, a horizontality that again is a kind has something to do with an ethics of being with others in um, an ethics of a relation with others that um, is being with them in their dying, which is why I relate it to something like palliative care. And I've, I've been thinking about palliative care in relation to um, the planet, and then I'll stop because Gail mentioned the planet and environmental degradation, degradation and so forth. And I think thinking about the state that we're in in relation to the planet as some sort of palliative care is worth thinking about more. Um, so I'll just, you know, we're in this time of mass extinction and so forth, but there's, you, you know, the time of extinction is, is a time, it's, it's a between time. So what do we do in that between time? And if we think of it as like, if we look at the earth as something that maybe is dying, how do we live in that? How do we be in that? Um, how do we live that ethically um, as a kind of um, holding vigil, right? That I think has all kinds of implications for, um, for ethics. And I, I would say, uh, you know, as a stretch for politics as well. I mean, you'd have to make those connections, but I think those connections could be made. So I'll stop there. Thank you. We have two excellent questions from the audience, but I also want to invite um, the panelists to ask more questions as well. And also Emily, who I know has some really great questions. Um, I'm going to bring you first a question from uh, another student from my senior seminar, uh, Will Bruno. And Will asks, question for Dr. Heffer. Based on what, what Dr. Ishlakel posited, oh, I should click answer live. Well, I oh, will a second. Based on what Dr. Ishlakel posited, can the process of ethopoesis still be called that if Foucault was seeking out the erotic in the archive rather than stumbling upon it? Or maybe it's doubly erotic if Foucault intended or expected to hear the murmurs of the archive. So does it, I think there Will is thinking about, um, I mean, I think about that moment in Lives of Infamous Men where Foucault talks about, uh, right, that, that these uh, records show up to him as an effective mood, um, but does it matter uh, in terms of their erotic quality that they are stumbled upon um, or chosen? Um, yes, it does, to me it matters. I mean, this isn't like some definitive answer, but the way I read Foucault's encounter with the archives is less like I'm going in there looking for arrows and looking to be undone, it's, it's a, he calls it a chance encounter, right? Um, and it's, it's something that happens to him, right? So there's something about the unexpectedness of it that I think is important that, that has to do, not so much with like, I'm gonna set out to undo myself, right? It's not that, it's more something happens to me you know, in going through my life as this guy who like spent a whole bunch of time in archives, right? And I'm going about my life, I'm looking at something and then something comes upon me, right? I'm overtaken by something. This is where that Nietzschean eternal recurrence to me is really relevant, right? Because that's what it is. It's like past, peasant, future overtake me and I'm disoriented and I'm undone. And there's a temporal undoing that's involved in that, that I think is also part of the fact that the archive is about traces of the past. And it's not something that I'm looking for. It's not something that I set out to do. It's not self-help, right? <laughs> it's, it's something that happens to me. And um, I can't plan it or predict it, but I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I'm open to being transformed or changed by it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers Will's question, but that's my thoughts about it. I think you answered it beautifully. Um, <clears throat> we have one more question um, from the audience already that I want to um, be sure uh, makes it to you. So uh, Misha Steckel asks, I wonder how this archival system of intelligibility or the archive as historical a priori might relate to the conception of ontology that underlies Afro-pessimism and its notions of the human and the world as anti-Black. 
I'm especially thinking about this in relation to the conversation between Calvin Warren and Lee Edelman a week or two ago, at the end of which Edelman asserted that Warren assumes a Foucauldian understanding of Lacan in his argument that the Middle Passage instituted a new ontology, one which we might understand as a Foucauldian epistemic break. In line with your thinking about Foucault's anti-humanist approach to history in relation to Black studies, could we imagine a Foucauldian Afro-pessimism or Black nihilism in spite of Warren and Co.'s fervent opposition to Foucault's, Foucault and uh, Foucault's historicism? Fantastic question. Oh my God, Misha. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um... So yeah, I mean, a short answer is yes, I think we can imagine it. Um, and I, Taryn, I don't know if you'd want to put your work into that bucket, but um, I would want to suggest that perhaps this is a place where Taryn's work I think is relevant. Um, and you know, I've had lots of um, conversations with Calvin about this and he continues to insist that if you do history, you're a humanist and that's just the end of it. And um, yeah, so I'll just say what I said again, which is I think Foucault actually gives us a way of thinking about history that takes seriously this idea of um, anti-humanism that is also very much at work in Afro-pessimism. I was not able to attend the conversation between um, Calvin Warren and Lee Edelman, so I'm not sure exactly what that comment about Foucault and Lacan was about, so that's a little opaque to me. Um, but that's interesting. I wish I would have. I wish I would have heard that. But Taryn, do you want to say anything more about that? Because I know you've been thinking about Black Foucault quite a bit. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for that. Nice shout out, um, Misha, who was in my class as a, when I was still in grad school. Hello. Um, yes, I, I, in some ways, I think your question is is one I'm also grappling with. Um, insofar as I'm really interested in a sort of anti-humanist approach to history, which genealogy provides, and part of that is. To through thinking through genealogy through black feminist terms that I'm doing with my colleague Haley Harrell um, is really trying to think of something we call black Foucault, which is a defragmenting of Foucault and a reimagining of him through a different set of questions and histories. And, and I think obviously, and one of the, the kind of claims I make in my own work is that soul, the soul that Du Bois gives us actually produces a fracture. And that fracture marks itself in a variety of objects of black domesticity, which I then historicize in my work. And so that is a very clear way in which I sort of mark a sort of anti-humanist approach to a history that doesn't shore up a human. Um, and it's through a kind of perverse reading of Du Bois and trying to not to think outside the sort of dialectic that Du Bois is often sort of captured within, or and he himself even announces in a certain kind of way but is sort of using this frame of, of Foucault and uh, Du Bois against himself in some ways and Spillers, I'm sorry, not Spillers, Sylvia Winter to sort of think through this kind of fracture, this excess that subtends and marks double consciousness that then one can trace through history. Um, and in some ways, the kind of more compelling response to your answer is black folks have a privileged relationship to genealogy because blackness is already, already sort of scattered, fragmented, full of holes and abysses. Um, that I think that in some ways through Warren's sort of attempt to sort of produce a level of history that is about a continuity and an absolute refusal of the discontinuity of history and understanding the difference between genealogy and histor history in the traditional sense, um, we lose something. And I'm trying to sort of point to that in a sort of discontinuous history of soul. So, yeah. Thank you, Misha. And in fact, we have a question in the Q&A from Dr. Jordan's uh, frequent interlocutor, uh, interlocutor, excuse me, Haley Harrell. So Emily, will you please read us that one? Absolutely. So uh, they ask, thank you all for such engaging discussion. I have a question for Professor Huffer about the relationship of genre and eros. Thinking through your citation of Fred Moten, is eros a kind of poetics? Is it theatrical? Is it genre-less? In other words, how does Eros emerge through language? Thank you, Haley. That's a great question. Um, I think genre matters, but not as, um, I guess it goes back to what I was saying about the sacralization of literature and the way that literary studies um, 
sets up these conventions of genre that become very rigid, right? Um, and pin things down in particular ways. So you have theater as a genre, you have poetry as a genre and so forth. And um, I think Foucault is playing with those genres, right? But I also think he's redeploying them in a way that it's not genre-less, but it's, um, maybe it's like a collage of, of genres, something like that. I'm not sure because he's, I, I think of his, him as a poetic thinker. He's constantly thinking about that poetic cut and the, those cuts, you know, knowledge is made for cutting is related to the poetic cut. And earlier today um, in talking about my other work, I was also talking about collage and the cut, um, which I think is also relevant. But obviously, I mean, Haley, you and I have talked about the theatricality of Foucault's writing. Um, I mentioned earlier the way sometimes all of a sudden there will be these two voices that emerge. Like there's, that happens at the end of the 1972 preface to History of Madness. All of a sudden there are these two voices, right? There's, it happens again in Archaeology of Knowledge. It's like, where do those two voices come from? There's something very playful and theatri theatrical about it. He also uses that theatrical, um, theatricality um, in Lives of an Infamous Men when he talks about the dramaturgy of the real. So theatricality um, and voice, the voice of theater, I think is also something that's really important to Foucault. But then there, he also writes histoire, right? Which is both stories, like in the sense of, you know, like a, like a fairy tale or something, right? But also history in the sense of like, the history that historians do in archives. So I think he's he's redeploying all of these genres in ways that are not genre-less, but are using the techniques associated with the conventions of genre to prod us to think and feel differently. I hope that answers your question, Haley. Um, let's see, we're getting um, some really more excellent questions, probably more than we have time to field, but uh, I'm delighted to field one from Annabelle Kim, who, if I'm right, is the Annabelle Kim that I went to undergrad with a long time ago. So if you're here, Annabelle, hi, thanks for coming. Um, and Annabelle asks, I love, or Annabelle says, excuse me, that I love that freedom isn't in this index. It feels right to me that freedom would be outside or beyond indexicality. This felicitous omission or lack of capacity makes me wonder, can freedom be achieved? Also makes me think that every index should have an anti-index, an index of those things that cannot be indexed. Yeah, actually it says, can freedom be archived? Oh, yeah. thank you. Can freedom be archived? No, I think you're right, Annabelle. Um, so yeah, maybe, so it's absolutely right that freedom is not in the index. I don't know what more to say about that, except that there is something about indices, in, you know, indexes, indices, um, that is, um, it's kind of like the enquete, right? Um, there's a pinning down that happens. Um, and in the index, it's like, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever made an index, but it's no fun. And you have to like go through and see how many times different terms occur. And that's why this last time I paid somebody else to do it because it really is a drag to do an index. But there's something very um, disciplinary, pinning down, um, consolidating, and um, what's the word? Like it, it congeals things in a way that I find um, that feels like unfreedom to me, honestly. And so I, I like what you're saying about that, Annabelle. We have two more questions that just came in. Um, let's see, Emily, would you like to pick one to read? Yes, I was particularly struck by uh, Joel Reynolds question about um, doing mad studies um, he asks, since to my knowledge, there is no social identity based X studies that escapes the general concern about speaking in the voice of reason. Does this mean that someone who takes Foucault seriously can't, shouldn't, wouldn't do disability studies any more than they would do gender studies, women's studies at all? I'm worried that there's a conflation between identity categories and concepts that describe an aspect of experience. 
No, Joel, absolutely. That's very well said. Um, and I completely agree with you. Um, and all I can say that whether we do disability studies or queer studies or women's studies is, is for me, it's an experience of inhabiting these spaces that we're both completely committed to and devoted to and that we're also really suspicious about at the same time. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, it's not an either or. It's like, that's the tension that we live in, right? Is that we have to talk about madness in the voice of reason, but the, the alternative is to not talk about it at all, right? Which is, I think, why Foucault says that history of madness is, to write a history of madness is an impossible task. And yet he wrote this 700 page book, right? Um, so it's, it's living in that tension, in that paradoxical space um, that I think all of us are grappling with. I mean, Saidiya Hartman's grappling with that, right? Is, is you know, we're using these tools that, that are connected to forms of violence to try to contest violence, right? And, and um, I don't know a way to get out of that tension. And so I try to think about the tension as something that's generative and that can continue conversation, but that we need to remain wary of the anthologization and institutionalization of these things, right? Joel responds, thank you for that very, very helpful answer. Um, and we have another question from Strand Thomason who asks, I'm thinking about time in Foucault and Deleuze lately, and I wonder what you might say about the time of the archive. Deleuze distinguishes drawing from stoicism between chronos or an extended present of which the past and future are modes and ion or the instant that subdivides the present. Deleuze rather frustratingly calls ion the eternal truth of time and time's pure form. Thinking about Deleuze, I wonder how you might characterize the time of the archive. Is it more Kronos, Ion, or something else entirely? Fantastic question. Oh, God, that took, Lauren, you just made the question go away. That was a Oh, I did? Oh, I'm sorry. Here, I can make it come back. You can oh, see it in the questions which are labeled as answered. Okay, sorry. Great. Yeah, it's a complicated question, so I need to look at it for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, where did it go? Here it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, all right. So this, so Kronos is an extended present of which the past and future are modes an ion or the instant that subdivides the present. Um, so I guess what I'm, and look, I don't know Deleuze as well as you do. I've worked with Deleuze a little bit, but I'm not a Deleuze expert. Um, so I'm just gonna speak from what I know about Foucault in relation to how you're describing Kronos and Ion. And what I would say um, is, is that in Foucault, in the archive, you're working with both, right? You're both working with this dilation of the present of which the past and the future are modes. Um, and again, I think that this, I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not sure exactly how further about what Deleuze thinks about that, um, except that it, it feels like it has something to do with something that might be recursive. I don't know if that's right or not, but, um, and then Ion, the instant that subdivides the present, which is this, this conception of the present constantly being interrupted by a rupture um, of something that is strange, right? So that any, any sense of temporality that you get from continuity is gonna be constantly interrupted by the startle, by the startle of the archive. Because I think the time of the startle um, is the time of the instant that subdivides the present. Um, so I, I think that's one of the reasons in, terms, in temporal terms why the affect of startle which is something that Foucault encounters in the archive or something that Foucault experiences in the archive um, is, is important. So that's about all I can say about that, I'm sorry. Um, we are coming up toward the end of the time of our session and I want to respect the other commitments of the panelists. Um, I know that Perry has something coming up and so he's gonna have to dip out in a second, but thank you so much, Perry, for your time and your comments in this panel. Um, 
I see a, uh, an excellent thought in here from Nikki Karalekas. Oh yeah, Nikki, um, thanking us and asking us to think, oh, that, that she's in a history of madness reading group with therapists and psychiatrists. That's really interesting. Um, and I want to welcome any last questions um, from the panelists who are here, from the audience. Um, I also wanna honor that uh, Lynn Huffer has been participating in a workshop with me since 9.45. So she might be tired, um, she's human, but um, she's just been a font of amazing ideas all day. So uh, let's, let's enjoy this last little minute. Any, um, any last thoughts from the panelists or the audience? I do wish we were all in a room too. I just want to say thank you again to you, Lauren, to the panelists, to Len for this wonderful book and this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. If I could jump in with a quick question. I was, um, you know, I had prepared questions coming in, but after listening to the various panelists, of course, all of those questions changed. Um, but when that came through, um, in both Perry Zern's talk and um, in Celine Ishlikow's talk as well, the, the theme or I guess I, I dare say a theme of sacrality and then the sort of push against the sacrality of the text that you identify in Foucault. I was wondering if you could expand on this pattern within Foucault's Strange Arrows specifically, this sort of the sacredness of the bending over as if in prayer, um, but also and the vigil, but also this resistance to the sacred. Interesting. That's a super interesting question, Emily. I hadn't thought about the bending over as a kind of sacredness, but it's true. Um, so here's an initial thought about this, and I'll have to think about it some more. Is that it goes back to eros as a verb, right? So there's something about the sacralization of literature. It, it's kind of related to what I said to Haley about genre as a convention that gets kind of fixed, right? Um, it's static, right? It becomes like the static form. It becomes a package, right? To contain affect, all kinds of other messy things that aren't containable, right? Um, and I think you, I think that's something that Foucault's thinking about when he's critical of the sacralization of the literary text. Like in French studies, you learn how to do an explication de texte, right? And it has these different parts, and it's it's very regimented. And this is how you analyze a poem, and this is how you analyze a theatrical work, and this is how you you know count the rhythm of a poem, and so forth. And it, it, it's this whole industry that is a kind of pinning down of how to read. And I think in the bending over and then these other gestures that I'm relating to Eros, it's the verbiness of it, right? It's, it's, it's the motion of it. It's not something that's ever gonna be pinned down. And so the bending over, it could be bending over a dead body. It could be bending over somebody who's dying. It could be bending over um, a document in an archive, right? It could be any of those kinds of bending over and it's a momentary thing, which I think goes back to this idea of historical contingency or Foucault is the boxer who's always moving, right? I think that's one of the ways that you stay out of the, um, the idea of the sacred as some kind of lockdown, right? But I guess there is something in the image of the sacred as a setting apart, right? there's something in that that I think I must value or else I wouldn't use those images, right? There's a, there's a setting apart. Um, it, maybe it's like a heterotopia or something. I'm not sure, but there's, it's not exactly like life as we usually live it. There's something weird about, about these spaces and these moments. There's something weird or strange about it that to me is like the sacred. So it's a weird sacred. <laughs> I wanna thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank our panelists so much and thank you so much, Lynn, for your, um, your time and your energy today. Um, Teresa Brennan has this phrase that she often uses called, um, she describes it as living attention, right? That we give our living attention to people. And I think about what I've been able to give my students 
this week, this semester, I think of what I've been able to give Emily, and I think about how much you've given me. And I know that Taryn and Celine, I, can, I think I can pretty confidently speak for both of them too. So, so thank you so much, Lynn. Um, we are um, very, uh, very glad to get to honor your book and um, to save this recording for others to appreciate it as well. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, and our session now, thank you very much to our attendees. I hope you'll pick up a copy of Foucault's Strange Eras if you have not. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely rest of their weekend. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Take care. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.